When you eat mostly insects, you have to somehow adapt to this diet, not to mention these insects can kill you. Oriental honey buzzards are up to the challenge. They mainly eat wasp and bee larvae, as well as pieces of honeycombs and honey. That didn't sound too dangerous, but bees and wasps are usually not thrilled when someone is trying to devour their offspring, so they fight back. Of course, they target the bird's head and neck first, so the oriental honey buzzards had to do something about it. They grew scales. Well, not quite the way you imagined. They have tough, scale-like feathers, especially near the beak, that act like chain mail. The feathers near the eyes even have special deep grooves for reliable protection against insect bites. Their stingers simply can't get through such protection. It's especially strong in males. And no, no other birds can boast of such protection. It's a trademark feature of oriental honey buzzards. Oh, one more thing. On Java Island, people believe oriental honey buzzards steal honeycombs from bees and then lure infuriated bees to humans so they'd attack them instead. That's clever. However, studies haven't confirmed whether it's true. Actually, the oriental honey buzzards are doing just fine. They got armor as a gift from evolution. The hooded pitui was much less fortunate. This bird is small, mainly eats fruits, and can easily become prey to a predator. Doesn't sound like a fair deal, which is why the hooded pitui decided to become toxic. People didn't realize it until 1989. Back then, an ornithologist, Jack Dumbacher, caught the hooded pitui in his nets. And when he was trying to release the bird, it scratched him. He was surprised the cut hurt more than he expected. To dull the pain, Jack put his cut finger in his mouth. He really shouldn't have, because his tongue and lips immediately went numb. After this incident, scientists found out the hooded pitui eats poisonous mellarid beetles. As a result, they accumulate so much toxin in their skin that just a few milligrams of skin eaten by a mouse can kill it in a few minutes. In short, I'd stay away from a hooded pitui. Even the natives of New Guinea eat hooded pitui only as a last resort, and only after carefully cooking it and removing its skin because as soon as the skin ends up in boiling water, you get an incredibly poisonous soup. Animals in chain mail? Check. Animals in poisonous armor? Check. Maybe there are also bulletproof animals. Steve decided to look it up, and you know what he found? Armadillos, of course! Actually, everyone knows these animals have grown something like a bony shell. It's made of a bunch of small shields on the head, on the shoulders, and the pelvic area for maximum protection. I wouldn't call armadillos 100% bulletproof. I mean, nature didn't design them that way. And yet, when a man in Texas fired three shots at an armadillo, one bullet ricocheted back at the shooter. He had to be taken to the hospital. As for the armadillo, it disappeared. Another similar case happened in Georgia. There, for some reason, a man also decided to shoot at an armadillo, but the bullet also bounced off its shell and hit his mother-in-law, who was resting nearby. She's fine, don't worry. But forget about armadillos, we have something more serious here. Bulletproof emu. Who would have thought these animals have such properties? People figured it out in late 1932 when the Great Emu War broke out in Australia. These large and fast birds spread quickly and began to eat agricultural crops. They literally destroyed crops as soon as they became edible, and people were simply left with nothing to eat. Did the emu care? No. And then Australia declared war on them. An actual war. Soldiers armed with Lewis guns and a lot of ammunition had to solve the problem, but emus were surprisingly resistant to machine gun fire. As soon as the soldiers started shooting, the birds scattered in a panic. Let me remind you, they are very fast. Speed up to 30 miles per hour and thick feathers made emu virtually immune to bullets. It took an average of 10 bullets to take down one bird. Later, Major Meredith, who commanded the offensive, said, and I quote, If we had a military division with the bullet-carrying capacity of these birds, it'd face any army in the world. They can face machine guns with the invulnerability of tanks. I wanted to make a beautiful transition here and ask you to look under the feet of bulletproof emus to see the leafcutter ant and its impressive armor. But the thing is, emus and leafcutters live on different continents. Okay, whatever. Let's talk about leafcutter ants anyway. They're strong enough on their own thanks to their exoskeleton, but apparently this was not enough for the ants, so they got biomineral covering. You get it, right? These are actual rock ants. They're shield-like armors made of calcite with high content of magnesium, which is usually found only in crabs or lobsters, but certainly not in insects. 
This rocky shell is made up of thousands of tiny plate-like crystals that reinforce their exoskeleton, and of course they don't appear out of nowhere. As far as I understand, ants benefit from symbiotic bacteria that protect them from harmful fungi and at the same time gradually build up their armor. This armor helps preserve all the limbs intact while battling other ants. Scientists even run additional tests to make sure. You got armor? Good for you. No armor? You lose your head. Well, if you think about it, armor made by bacteria is nothing compared to armor made from feces. Some of the leaf beetles are literally born in a cocoon of their mother's feces. The female diligently smears them all over the egg, and then when the young beetle is born, it crawls together with its cocoon. It only sticks out its head and legs. Oh, it also adds more feces as it grows so it'd fit. Such armor scares off predators, which often don't even approach the leaf beetle because they just think it's a piece of dung. As for the fact that it crawls, well, weird things can happen, right? But even the toughest and most durable creatures got nothing on this beetle called the diabolical ironclad. It looks like a piece of asphalt about an inch long. It can't fly and wouldn't be of much interest to scientists if not for the fact that the diabolical ironclad beetle can withstand the loads of about 39,000 times its own weight. It's as if 25 blue whales were dropped on a person. He'd crawl out from under them, dust himself off, and be cool with it. Or 40 M1 Abram tanks or 280 double-decker buses. Pick any unit to measure how cool this beetle is. It's clear that the beetle needs such strength to protect itself from predators, but insect collectors aren't thrilled about its toughness. Among entomologists, the diabolical ironclad beetle is known for its fantastic strength. Its armor bends even steel pens used to mount insects for display. To penetrate the armor of this beetle, you need a hammer or a drill, and it'll still take a lot of effort. And when you're a bird and you don't have the right tools, well, you'll have to look for some other lunch. And now meet a Cystosoma! What? Can't see it? How about now? In fact, the only way to see the Cystosoma is to take a photo or video of it in artificial lighting. Under natural conditions, there's simply no such amount of light, which means you won't see it. it sounds weird, but this creature literally blends in with the water. That is, it's transparent. Sounds useful when you need to hide in the open ocean, but that's not enough for the Cystosoma. They went one step further and created their own invisibility cloak, an anti-reflective coating. It actually comes in handy because deep sea predators can cast light on their prey. How do you illuminate something that doesn't reflect light? The body structure of Cystosoma is similar to the wings of Greta Odo butterflies, but this appears to be only part of their adaptations. Scientists have yet to figure out how Cystosoma became what it is. But these are not the only transparent creatures in the ocean. The offspring of some fish have no protection, so they try to blend in with the water until they grow up. You know that feeling when you were so unremarkable as a kid, and then you grow up and have a scale vest? No? The Arapaima gigas fish does. When you live in the Amazon River, you simply need to have some protection. These fish have really grown body armor. Their scales have a hard mineralized outer layer that's hard to break through. The outer layer is connected to the inner elastic layer made of collagen. That means the scales can be deformed when bitten, but they don't tear, break, or get punctured, protecting the fish from injury. That is, even if someone attacks the arapaima and bites it hard, the predator won't get through. Like, no way! This is such a complex and useful protection that scientists plan to recreate something similar for people to make bulletproof vests. But scientists aren't evolution. So far, they haven't been successful. Today, the biggest threat to arapaima is giant otters, and they managed to bite through that bulletproof vest. So far, it's scary to imagine what these fish will grow in a couple of million years. If I were a giant otter, I'd be seriously concerned. Wait, hold on. I suddenly realized that all the types of natural armor we've mentioned today appeared as a response to predators. Time for something different. Musk oxen did that for a different reason, because their enemy is frost. I mean, there are also predators, but musk oxen have horns and a very strong skull against them. Meanwhile, the habitats of musk oxen are damn cold. Bare tundra with chilling winds and temperatures below minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit? That's very cold, extremely cold. If you can't imagine what it's like, 
Just check this out. That's why every part of the muskox, except for the lips and nostrils, is covered with dense fur. This fur is two-layered, very long outer hair, plus a thick under fur eight times warmer than sheep's wool. Eight times! The wind probably can't get under their fur at all. As for the shape of the body, musk oxen are like barrels with short legs. This is also necessary to keep warm. To withstand the cold, musk oxen try to avoid walking much. Weirdly enough, this works. See you later.